you could give up or stop, but that wouldn't be the right answer or our outcome. So you just keep going and, and every day you wake up and figure out what's the most right next step to be taking to get to where you want to go. Well, uh, to start, before we get into the book, which I, I told you I would read and I loved, uh, I Thank wanted you. to start with, the, the title is Play Nice But Win, which is a, a nice little motto. I wanted to start with a little motto you told me you also have, which I thought might be uh, the title of the book when you told me you were working one, uh, PBNS. Will you tell people what that means <laughs> and, uh, and, and how you try to live that too? Yeah, so PBNS is pleased but never satisfied, or sometimes pleased but not satisfied. And sort of the idea behind this is, you know, continuous improvement uh, is important and complacency, complacency kills. And, you know, when you're succeeding, uh, it can be really intoxicating and also very dangerous uh, because you, your brain kind of turns off, right? <laughs> And, and and so, um, you know, when you're when you're in an industry that's always evolving, you you need to be thinking about what are the future problems, and uh, you know, it's just super dangerous to sort of believe your own nonsense, you know. Yeah. And and uh, I have this I have this uh, this uh, cover from Fortune magazine in my office. Um, and it's, and I'm not on the cover. It's, it's a guy named Ken Olson and he was the CEO of digital equipment. And, and it, it says, it says basically America's most successful entrepreneur, you know, Ken Olson, CEO of digital equipment and 1986, you know, um, that was the story they wrote. And, you know, if you were a digital equipment and you believe that, right. Uh, you know, you were not thinking about all the things that were about to happen in the industry. Sure. And, you know, so, yeah, I just think it's a really important approach. <laughs> well, it's, it's an interesting tension, right? Because I think when we think of like champions, when you think of Tom Brady, you think of someone who's never satisfied, right? Who's always trying to get better, always pushing themselves. But that's also can be, uh, I don't know if you saw the Michael Jordan documentary last year, but also a recipe for for misery, both for yourself and for other people in a way. So I, when I heard that, what struck me about it was the emphasis on the first part, which is also being pleased and happy. Uh, th th those two ideas need to be balanced out. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, I think it took me some time to learn how to um, appreciate and celebrate our successes. And, and partly because, um, you know, when, when people would would uh, bring accolades to me, I was generally skeptical that they wanted something from me because <laughs> they often did. Right. And so sure. I, I kind of uh, just never really needed that. And, but, but I figured out that other people did and, and, and it's important to, to celebrate and uh, you know, to, to, yeah, to, to, to talk about the, the, the successes. Well, one of the stoic ideas that, that I try to work on, and I'm not perfect at it, is this idea of being uh, very strict with yourself, but also tolerant with others. And so where I think this motto makes sense or is, is important, I have to imagine in, in management, which is like, you can be never satisfied with your own performance, but if, you never, if you're never pleased as a boss, you will grind the people that work for you down into dust. They will hate you. They will hate working for you. And you actually won't get better performance out of them because eventually they'll just go, it's impossible to please Michael. He's never <laughs> satisfied. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely true. And, and so it is important to, to celebrate and, and recognize achievement and, and also recognize that every person is motivated by something a little bit different. And, um, you know, when you're running a big organization, you kind of need to have a place where anybody can succeed, you know, uh, no matter what their, their you know, proclivities and, and background is. So when I was reading the book, it's, it's very rare that the first sentence in a book will provoke the react a reaction in me and yours did. Because my first reaction, and it doesn't, it, it eventually gets addressed later in the book, but I remember thinking, 
I'm supposed to believe that Carl Icahn's wife cooks meatloaf. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I, 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 I struggled whether, whether I should put that, you know, in, 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 in the book, but, you know, it, it was really the, the definition of, of Carl as a character. Yes. And, and how, he, how he kind of explained his, his life and circumstance to me that, that brought into sharp clarity sort of what kind of character he, he actually is. And um, yeah, I mean, it was a pivotal moment in my process of, you know, trying to take the company private and, uh, you know, I confronted him and sort of started the story out <laughs> being, being at his house and, and uh, having, having dinner with him over his, his wife's meatloaf. But, but actually to go to the idea of please, but never satisfied, there's this exchange you have at, at that meeting where he's sort of like, I don't want to, it's jealous, but also like impossible to please. He's, he's like upset that at his son's success. Right. And it struck me as kind oh, of yeah. an interesting embodiment of like, please, but never uh, the, uh, sort of never satisfied where, where it, it just struck me like it must not be fun to be Carl Icahn's son or wife. You know, Al, also what you have him say about his wife's cooking doesn't seem uh, like the nicest dude either. Yeah, and I, I normally wouldn't uh, go there, but, but you know, he sort of attacked me and, and eventually I had to sort of uh, respond in some way. But, you know, the, the, the way he, he talked about his son was, was particularly disturbing to me uh, because – you know, you know, as, as a father, you know, and I've heard you talk about, you know, being a father and fatherhood. I mean, kind of the, the thing you hope, you know, uh, most for is that your children are successful, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then, you know, and even, even more, you'd like to be surrounded by grandchildren, right? That, sure. that love you, right? Uh, and uh, so, yeah, it was, it was a pretty striking, um, you know, way in which he kind of dealt with the whole concept of his son actually doing something that that uh, was working. If you're like me, you grew up eating the sugariest, most unhealthy cereal you could possibly imagine. You can't even wrap your head around how your parents allowed you to do this. And now that you're older, you want to eat healthier, you want your kids to eat healthy, but you still love the delicious taste of cereal. That's what I love about Magic Spoon. It's high protein, keto friendly, gluten free, grain free, soy free, wheat free, totally delicious. I just absolutely love it. 13 grams of protein, only five net carbs, zero grams of sugar. It's just the best cereal. I don't eat cereal in the morning most times, but I do have it for dessert a lot of days. Just absolutely great. We pick these wild blackberries on our farm. I eat that in there, but check it out. I think there's free shipping with your order. You can use code Ryan Holiday. Thanks to Magic Spoon for sponsoring this video and this podcast. Seriously, it's legit delicious. Yeah, it was it was very it was very surreal. Well, let's let's back up. Let's talk about the acquisition because that's how you open the book and you talk about it. And I I thought about this actually a little bit when I was writing my book on ego. There is something. It's kind of an interesting metaphor. The idea of like taking a company private or uh, you know, buying back shares of a company on the open market. Um, obviously, some people do this for financial manipulation reasons, or some, sometimes it's a sign of a lack of innovation in a company. But it also struck me metaphorically as this idea of like the market, which is supposed to be this all-knowing, efficient thing, is saying X, right? It's saying that you are worth X. And there require either a delusional amount of ego or a very evidence-based form of confidence that is able to say, actually, we're worth X plus 20%, or that, that in the future, we're going to be worth 3X or, or whatever, whatever it happens to be. Walk me through how you get to a place where you feel like you know more about something than the, all the smartest people in the world ostensibly like and then and then are willing to to take that bet and in this case one of the biggest bets or, or i think at the time the biggest bet in the history of tech well first first of all you have to say you never know for sure right you, you just kind of have an idea or or a, a hunch and you know what 
what was happening then, and, and I think this has happened a couple of times during my career, the popular narrative had kind of swung too far. Mm-hmm. And the, the popular narrative at the time was that uh, smartphones were everything, you know, and, and uh, you know, uh, the smartphone and the tablet were on, on the rise and, you know, the PC was dead and we're never going to use PCs anymore. We'll just use smartphones. And, you know, while it's true that, that you know, there are 5 billion smartphones in the world, uh, we're actually shipping way more PCs than we've ever shipped. You know, and, and, and people continue to use PCs, right, as part of their productivity. But more than that, we were investing in lots of areas way beyond the PC, you know, in sure. software and services and security and all these things. And the market sort of didn't really buy it or understand it. And um, we wanted to transform the company. And when you're a public company, you're you're kind of on this 90 day shot clock, right? And so by, by going private, we were able to free ourselves from that 90 day shot clock and accelerate the transformation. Our public shareholders got a significant premium to the price of the stock, you know, without having to take any of the risk. And we got the chance to, you know, uh, roll the dice as it were, right? And yeah. get very aggressive and, hire thousands of additional engineers and salespeople. And, you know, then uh, a couple of years later, we did the biggest merger acquisition ever in technology and, you know, come out of a transformed company. Yeah. It, it, it's not obviously the courage of running into a burning building or something, but that, that must've been a deeply scary thing to do to essentially go all in. I mean, as you say a couple of times in the book, or you're actually negotiating this from your house in Hawaii. You must have thought, I could just hang out here. I don't have to do any of this. Instead, you're going all in and yeah, one of the biggest transactions in history, which no one can guarantee you is going to succeed. In fact, it may uh, end disastrously. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't have done it if I thought it was going to fail. And, and, sure. and, and I, I, did, I thought the downside was actually pretty limited. I mean, um, just just being objective, I mean, this is a company that had for a long time generated very strong cash flows and tons of revenue. And while it was true that the smartphone was, you know, playing a bigger role in technology, you know, I just thought the popular narrative had run too far. So even even if we hadn't grown, uh, you know, we could have done quite well, paid off a lot of debt, had a lot of flexibility. Um, you know, it, it, you know, it turns out we did way better than we thought. And, and, uh, you know, it, it, it all worked out, you know, really well. And, and actually the, there was another popular narrative that came, which was that everything was going to the public cloud. And while it's true, the public cloud was growing, you know, uh, things like the edge where everything in the physical world is becoming intelligent and this idea of multi-cloud have emerged. And, you know, that was kind of what enabled us to combine with EMC and VMware and, you know, create even more opportunity. So uh, kind of made a bit of a career in going against, you know, uh, popular narratives that have swung too far. Well, I remember when I was talking to Peter Thiel, he said something about his investing strategy, which was like, what do I know that they don't know, right? And so maybe it's like the narrative is this. And if the narrative is true, obviously you listen to the narrative, but if you have some sort of, it's not the same as inside knowledge, but you have some sense or deeper experience that lets you know that there is something wrong with the narrative, then you feel confident making the bet that you're making because you know something that the people who believe in the narrative don't know or, or have willed themselves not to see. And it's not as if we were acting in, with secret information either, right? right? I mean, you know, if, if, if you go back, you know, I was giving speeches in public in 2012 and talking about everything we were doing and why it was important, why I believed it would work, but, uh, you know, market didn't, didn't agree with me. So, you know. Uh, right. Yeah. What's that, that thing like, uh, don't worry about people stealing your ideas or you'll have to ram it down their throats. Like you, you were public about it and then, People still doubted you. And then 
I think about that as a writer, like, cause you know, you, and you probably went through with your, your book and we're both at portfolio is like, you do the book and then you get a bunch of notes and how do you decide what notes to listen to and what notes not to listen to? Right. And, and I think this is true in life. You get feedback. How do you know if the market is, sometimes the market is saying X and it's true. Sometimes the market is saying Y and it's, it's actually X. And so how do you know what to listen to if it's just, I, I always trust myself, you know, you're going to be right sometimes and then terribly wrong other times. And then also, if you always listen to what other people say, you're probably going to be far too conservative and risk averse and, and wrong in a lot of other ways. Yeah. And in the market, it's never binary. There's always like degrees of, of, of all these things. And, you know, um, I think having big years and listening and being reflective and spending a lot of time with our customers, you know, you, 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 you know, you feel like you, you have some, some uh, understanding of what's, what the situation is. And then maybe that's where you get to the title, which is, okay, you're right. You're, you, you think you're right. And then you put out what you think is a fair, you try to do it. And then, of course, life is much more complicated than just simply being correct. Then you, then you get in a street fight about it. And uh, the one who emerges victorious is, is the one who is, who is right. Yeah, I wasn't expecting all of that to happen. And it turned out to be way more complicated than, than I thought. But, you know, in, in the end, it all, it all turned out well. Well, so don't you find that people, and maybe this is why you have the motto, is people sometimes think that being right is enough, or that having a good idea is enough, or that, uh, you know, um, uh, having a good product is enough. It also is that street fight, like you do have to go toe to toe with the Carl icons, or you do have to buck uh, a bunch of people telling you you're wrong or um, any of that. It's, it's always more complicated and more difficult than it probably should be. <laughs> yeah, uh, that's right. And, and um, you know, uh, you know, when, when I was going through it, I mean, you know, I was kind of reminded of the Winston Churchill, you know, if you're going through hell, just keep going, right? Mm-hmm. It's like, you don't really have any choice. I mean, sure. you know, you could, you could give up or stop, but, that wouldn't be the right answer or or outcome. So you just keep going and and every day you wake up and figure out what's the most right next step to be taking to get to where you want to go. But so how do you manage that when you are against someone or in some industry where either it's rigged or people are fighting quite unfairly? Like it it seemed like just from the way you talk about it, it, it really bothered you the way people could just sort of go on television and lie about things. And then you were forced to both respond and address that as if it was the same as playing fairly. Like how, how do you, how do you, how have you found over the years that you navigate sort of tricky terrain like that? Well, and of course the reason for it was he was a magnet for the media, right? Mm-hmm. And he was entertaining. It's not that they actually agreed with what he was saying. Sure. Just pe- people watched him because, you know, it was like a dumpster fire or something. It's like really interesting to watch him just mouth off about all this stuff. Um, you know, which is why I ultimately decided to confront him face to face because I wanted to, uh, you know, understand, you know, what, what was he really thinking? It turns out he wasn't really thinking much of anything. And so then, you know, I knew it would still be a grind, but, you know, I, I, I knew, you know, he, he wasn't going to uh, make good on any of the ridiculous, you know, promises or, or claims that he, he'd thrown out there. So it was kind of just, just uh, you know, letting the truth ultimately, you know, uh, bubble, bubble itself up and, and, you know, persevering, outlasting him and, uh also, you know, kind of calling his bluff and, and telling him, okay, you know, hey, if you, you know, you want to do it, go right ahead. You're going to screw it up, by the way. And then and I'll come back and buy it from you at a lower price. And, you know, that was when I saw he was, he was truly terrified, you know, <laughs> and, and uh, you know, that gave me a better understanding of what I was dealing with. Yeah. Some of these characters that maybe we hear about on television or we see, you know, uh, we read about or we, we think live these sort of glamorous 
or interesting wives. I'm sure you've met your fair share of them. And then you sort of, you get to peek behind the curtain and you kind of go, oh, it's probably not actually fun to be that person or that they're almost acting under a kind of compulsion or addiction, or they just like, they can't stop. They just sort of are who they are. And what you see, there's that, that expression that character is fate. It just sort of, this is who they are. This is how they'll always be. And uh, you sort of just have to leave them as they are. Yeah, I mean, it's just kind of kind of a sad uh, human being, um, and um, you know, I think I think his 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 challenges not to psychoanalyze probably came from the way his father treated him, mm-hmm. based on what what he told me. But um, you know, at this stage in his life, he sh- probably should be doing other things to <laughs> to uh, help others. But that's not what he's generally doing. But that, but that also goes back to the idea of please, but never satisfied is that often the person who is like, let's say early on, you pick up some idea that like to, to, to make my dad proud, I just always have to do X, Y, or Z, or that like, if, if I ever stop trying to get better, you know, people will laugh at me. We can pick up these sort of early mm-hmm. compulsions that can be quite adaptive as far as making us deeply specialized and talented at a singular thing. And then they sort of get us there. They get us to the top of a certain mountain, but at what cost? Yeah, yeah, can't can't argue with that. <laughs> but you, but uh, I, I mean, I don't know you super well. You you do seem to be uh, for one of the richest, uh, most successful people in the world who employs hundreds of thousands of people. You do seem to be uh, fairly well adjusted. <laughs> I hope so. Uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I've, uh, I, you know, don't, I, I, I don't think I've, I've changed, uh, you know, a, a lot of my super core beliefs, uh, you know, from, from, from when I was, you know, let's say in a, in a, in a, in a less fortunate position. Um, and, yeah, I continue to learn and, and grow, but but yeah, I think I've kept my feet on the ground and and uh, focused on on the right things. How much of that is your wife? I mean, you've been married for what 30, 32 30, years, something. Thirty-two like that? years. Yeah, I think it's I think it's a I think it's a big part of it. You know, having that. Uh, actually, tomorrow is our thirty thirty second anniversary. Thing. Thank you. Uh, having that strength of relationship and having her as a thought partner and a sounding board, you know, against all the things that are going on in not just my life, but our collective life together uh, has been, has been incredibly important. And, you know, she, she has tons of unique insights and perspectives that, that, you know, I don't have. Well, I imagine it's also the continuity and the consistency that helps keep a person grounded. You know, it's like, as one becomes more and more successful, you can sort of cast off certain things or level up in certain things, but you become untethered as a result because you are, you've lost sort of who you once were, or what was once important to you. I'm sure you've seen that many times with people that, you know, I've seen that happen with, with others. And, and uh, you know, I, I, fortunately, I don't think I've, uh, that's not the path I've taken. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and then, you know, when you're with someone for a very long time, they have the ability, no matter who you are, or what you've done to call you out on your bullshit. Yeah. And, you know, I'd say the same for some of my other family members, right? You know, my, my brothers, my, my dad, other, other, other family members, you know, that, that, you know, have no, known me pretty much my whole life. So you know, uh, I, I think that's, that's, that's super important. Well, how much is staying in one spot also done that, right? Like, uh, I'm sure you could be based anywhere in the world, but you're still sort of right where you started. Yeah. um, You know, it's, 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 it's home. I I love, I love Austin. Uh, It's, you know, I came here when I was a freshman at, at UT and, Fell, fell in love with the place and never, never thought of really leaving. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I like the story in the book about, you know, your sort of your parents and they're struggling to understand just what the hell you were doing in your, in your dorm room. Um, why do you think, and now that you're, you're a parent, um, 
and all, all your kids are out of college now, right? Yes. So did it give you more empathy for your parents and their struggles to understand uh, you wanting to leave college or not taking college seriously? Oh, yeah. I mean, no, I totally understood how my parents thought about it. I mean, you know, they were the first you know, uh, of their generation to to go to college. Right. And yeah. and so the idea of giving up this opportunity for an education just was a total anathema to them. And so they, they're like, you got to be out of your mind right, to, to to be thinking about it that way. So I, I, I totally understood that. Um, you know. Yeah, it, it's just it's it's the irony of like you're making hundreds of thousands of dollars a month and they're like, but why aren't you going to chemistry class or whatever <laughs> it is? Right. Like there's this sort of I think as a parent, you probably just want your kid to be safe as opposed to uh, maximize their potential or fulfill their dreams. Yeah. And ultimately, what I figured out was that you could take a semester off and go back to college yeah. with no academic penalty. And so I kind of convinced them that that was okay. And we sort of, you know, developed a bit of a compromise. Yeah. I remember when I decided to drop out of college, I went into the registrar's office to drop out. I went to the University, the University of California, Riverside. So similar to UT. And, and, and I remember going and being like, I'm here to drop out. And they were like, you don't have to do that. You can just, you can just take a break and come back whenever you want. So this sort of decision that was so terrifying to me and sort of so <laughs> life altering, it was like, I only had to do 10% of the, the risk. You know what I mean? It, you, you, I think you often think these things, it's like, hey, I'm going to end up living under a bridge somewhere if I make this decision. But in fact, when you really get up and close with those risks, and, and maybe this is what you were saying about buying Dell back, that it's not actually as potentially catastrophic as it might feel when you haven't really kicked the tires. Yeah. And, and for me, you know, I mean, if I had, if I had not started anything and didn't have this business sort of thriving in my dorm room, then dropping out of college might've been a pretty big risk. Right. Sure. But, but uh, you know, I had de-risked it pretty significantly and I felt confident, you know, I could 10 X the business you know, just by sort of moving from my little tiny dorm room, you know, in, into a, a little tiny office. Well, that's kind of the weird mythology about dropouts, whether it's like Steve Jobs or, well, Steve Jobs actually kind of was a dropout. But when you look at like a Bill Gates or a Mark Zuckerberg, they weren't just dropping out to go find themselves. They had businesses that in some cases were making millions of dollars. Like they had employees exactly. and they were like, I can't go sit in a classroom. I have, I have staff meetings all day. Exactly. Yeah. So I think people think dropping out is this this hugely risky thing, which, as you said, it is if you don't know what you can do instead. But if you know what you can do instead, it's a very different thing. Yep. Precisely. Um, when you think about, because uh, again, to go back to Icon, it seemed like it, it was also the way you were sort of setting it up is a a sort of a contrast of approaches to life, sort of like you're a builder and then there is also a type of person who is very successful but doesn't actually make or do anything it seemed like maybe what you really objected to was the sort of financial engineering of it as opposed like it seemed like he was utterly indifferent and, and this may be what you talk about in that meeting it's like like what's your plan and he's like i don't know i have people like the idea that dell was a company comprised of human beings who make things seemed to be more your style and not the style of the people you were up against. Yeah. To him, it was a, a poker game, sort of a, a form of entertainment, you know, <laughs> and, 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 and something that he, he kind of had fun doing. Uh, and to me, it was much more, right. It was like people's lives. It was like what we're doing really matters in the world. Uh, you know, I carry, you know, a, 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 in my conscious, you know, the, the, this pretty heavy burden of, all the people that I'm, I'm in some way responsible for. And uh, it's not a poker game, right? <laughs> it's, this is like super important stuff. And, um, and you know, you, you can't just go on TV and lie about things and, 
you know, the, 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 the negative impact that that has on people's psyche and on, you know, uh, actual real outcomes, um, you know, just didn't really appreciate, you know, his, his, his approach at all. Yeah, like we're, we're obviously in the middle of some, some discussions uh, as a country about taxation, for instance. And it does strike me that we do a bad job distinguishing between sort of people who make things and people who make lots of money. And that those are, those are they're obviously different, but both can be paths to wealth, but that like we obviously, and we saw this during the pandemic, and we're seeing it now with these logistical issues and all that. It's like, we really do need people who make things, who know how to do things, who can solve hard problems. And that that is, a, that is different than just say people who uh, are, are good at moving numbers around on spreadsheets or are good at you know, playing poker, but, but that builders are a really important part of uh, making the world work. Yeah, and maybe I'm biased, but I, I think we need more of that in the future. You know, and if you think about all the sort of big challenges that are out there in decarbonization, energy, you know, environment, you know, healthcare, you know, et cetera, you know, these are some pretty big challenges to go after. And you're gonna have to have some bold risk-taking entrepreneurs and and capital to to fund them. Sure. To be able to 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 go solve those problems, and we should be um, kind of proud that we have a fair number of those here in this country. Um, you know, I'm not looking for accolades, but but I do think I do think a lot of countries would really uh, crave to have more of them. <laughs> you know, not not uh, not 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 less of them. Yeah, I'm not the, the world's biggest Ayn Rand fan, but the, the premise of Atlas Shrugged is I don't think you want to live in a world where all those people go away. Yes. But, but why do you think we struggle? Why, why do we struggle to solve tough problems? Mark Andreessen wrote that essay at the beginning of the pandemic about building things. Why do you think the, the most successful, uh, sort of most naturally risk, rich in resources country in the world seems to, it's not that we have an innovation problem because we're brilliantly innovative in some ways, but we seem to lack the ability to solve tough problems. The, the, obviously the vaccines uh, are a great example of what it looks like when it goes right, but then we also seem to be able to sol not solve the, the tough psychosocial issue of like getting people to take them, right? But why do you think we're struggling to solve these tough problems, whether it's climate change or, or whatever? Well, I, uh, first I'd say I don't know, uh, you know, um, but I, I think there are parts of society where there's more government involvement and more regulation. And I think those are areas where you tend to have less innovation. Uh, so, you know, if you take education and healthcare as two obvious examples, um, you know, these are areas where the government's very involved and there's a lot of regulation uh, and you don't have a lot of innovation. <laughs> and so, so just an observation. <laughs> so I, I think, you know, I, I as a as a uh, full red blooded capitalist, you know, I'm 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 a, I'm a more in the camp of let's, you know, uh, let, let's let's let innovation uh you know, uh, solve solve a lot of these challenges. I don't think I don't think uh, government uh, is is going to address many of these challenges. There's a role for government to play, but but uh, you know, if if I look at the things that we're doing and thousands of companies are voluntarily doing in some of the big uh, challenging areas, like in decarbonization. Uh, you know, I think that's actually going to move the needle much more than government uh, regulation. Yeah, I had uh, R.C. Buford uh, on a few weeks ago and we were talking about Adam Silver. So sort of the idea of sort of government versus private, I was like, why can't Adam Silver be in charge of everything? He seems like he's done a, a hell of a job. He has done he has done a great job and, and, and dealt with many crises and, and geopolitical issues and yeah, it's 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 complex, and 
you know. Um, <laughs> well, it's like it's like we're not sending our best, right? We clearly have the talent. We clearly have the capital. I was just thinking about this because uh, so my my oldest turns five uh, in two weeks. So he'll just right. So basically, right when he turns five, then he'll be eligible for the vaccines, which they're just about to roll out for kids. And so obviously, I've been following the news on it, and it was like you know, like uh, F. This is at the beginning of October. It's like you know, FDA set to meet about the approval of vaccines for kids, and blah blah blah. Uh, Pfizer churns in the data in, you know, late September and the FDA is like, okay, we'll meet about it on October 26th. <laughs> and, you know, just like who sets a meeting four months or, you know, four weeks from now in the middle of a, in the middle of a pandemic. And it, it did strike me as a contrast between sort of the private and the public approach of like, uh, what makes you think you can afford to take four weeks, right? And sort of the play nice, but when, Obviously, you got to be accommodating to people's schedule, but also get your ass in gear kind of a thing. Yeah, and, and I, I, I had the same frustration. You know, um, unfortunately, I don't know what we can do about it. Yeah. Uh, you know, g- g- given, given the, the democratic system that we have, um, which, which uh, as, as much as we might say it could be better, um, you know, um, people still want to come to this country and I still think it's the greatest country in the world, you know, by, by, by a lot, but you can certainly see some other systems out there where, you know, they have uh, a deterministic strategy. They're uh, investing in strategic industries in, in, in aggressive ways and they're advancing quite rapidly. And, you know, I think it's, I think it's good that you're starting to see, you know the 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 American government start to focus on things like semiconductors, like duh, hello, <laughs> uh, you know uh, these are important things. It, th- these strategic industries that play a role in so many aspects of the future, and if we just give up on those and we get hollowed out by other nation states that have a more deterministic, you know, uh, strategy around those. That's a super dangerous thing, you know, over over a long period of time. Yeah, it's uh, yeah, playing nice, but 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 trying to win also that you can't just expect these things to take care of themselves or uh, problems to resolve themselves. You do have to to sort of fight for the important things. And, and bureaucratically, we seem to struggle with. Yeah, what deterministic thinking? Sort of what is what is the outcome that we're trying to achieve, and let's back it out from there, not simply follow the process that we have always followed. And and there are also things that have a duration which is well outside the boundaries of the next election or cycle or two, and so they require a, uh, a you know a, a level of of thought and planning that you know we don't seem to be really great at. <laughs> Well, so actually, let's let's take that back to Dell then, because you have experienced it in all the different ways. You were you were talking if, if the election is a, a sort of shot clock, right? And you were saying you were stuck on a ninety day shot clock. Then you went private. Now you're public again. How have you thought about managing this shot clock, which is a real constraint, just as the ways midterms are a constraint and uh, presidential elections are a constraint? Um, and then in politics, they're all overlapping with each other. But how, how do you how do you think about it? And how could we do a better job thinking long term within these short term constraints? Yeah, I think as for for companies, you know, there are times in various market cycles and in the life of a company where the market may or may not give it permission to think with a longer term time horizon. Uh, we're in a better place now, and we're able to do that, and you know it's it's working well. Um, but you know, there's no guarantee that it'll continue, and 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 the market definitely goes through cycles. We 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 had a we had a tough time, you know, 2012, 2013. Um, you know, there there is there is a lot of risk capital out there that is that are funding big hard tech problems. And that's that's certainly a reason to be very optimistic about the future of not just 
you know, the U S but, but the world. Um, but you know, this, this question of, of how does the, how does the system of democracy, you know, address those kind of challenges? I think, I think first, first of all, it, it takes, it takes uh, bipartisanship, right. <laughs> uh, which, which there isn't a ton of, I think um, one of the things that happened in the, in the, you know, the, the last five years or so was a greater understanding of the threats, you know, uh, uh, of, of uh, China specifically, you know, uh, to, to, to America's continued growth and, and success. And that I think is leading to, uh, you know, s- some of the investments around semiconductors, which are a good thing. And hopefully we'll see more of that. And, it, and it's been a much more bipartisan agreement that it's a national priority. It's not, you know, sort of a, uh, you know, a blue party or a red party kind of a thing. But maybe it's just, yeah, what do we decide to focus on, right? You look at some countries a lot less innovative than America, and, you know, you can get a, a COVID test for a dollar at a grocery store in Germany. <laughs> Meanwhile, to get your results back on a PCR test in America, it takes three days, you know, two years into the pandemic. And it's because, you know, we decided to get bogged down in this mask discussion instead of, innovating our way out of the, not that masks are not important, obviously they are, but, you know, we, it's like, we seem to get locked in on these intractable like issues where 50% thinks this and 20% thinks this, and, you know, 30% doesn't care instead of focusing on sort of alternative solutions to the whole discussion entirely. It seems weird how we get stuck in these, uh, in these quagmires. Yeah. Again, you know, I'm, I'm not really sure what to do about that. Um, and and uh, you know, um, we we try to try to stay out of things that <laughs> that, 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 that that we can't do do you know sure. do a whole lot about. Yeah, yeah. I, ju- I just mean uh, to me, the lesson from that is like, what are you going to choose to focus your attention on? Uh, is it going to be on something? you don't control or is it going to be something that you you might have some 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 as as our mutual friend Matthew McConaughey says where you have some green lights right like are you going to focus on on where you can get some momentum going and i think strategically is we get stuck on like what's right you know or what i want as opposed to well what are the most what what are the actual possible solutions to this problem that would allow us to move forward in some way yeah, and we focus on the things we can control and where we can where we can make a difference, and you know where we think technology, and specifically our technology, can help. You know, democratizing access and uh, you know opening up the 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 opportunity set. I mean, there's a lot of work going on on 5G and broadband, and we kind of saw during the pandemic, you know the kind of fault lines in our society where some people weren't connected, they didn't have the right devices and they couldn't access education or healthcare or, uh, you know, their jobs or entertainment or anything else. And, you know, um, that's something we can actually help with. Right. And, and so, you know, we're, we're focused on that. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm at my bookstore right now, but, but where I live, which is like, 30 minutes from you, I, I have a broadband, uh, satellite broadband that downloads at like 10 kilobytes a second. I can barely stream Netflix. <laughs> I, I can almost see downtown Austin from my place and I am, you know, buffering on uh, reruns of The Office because the, the digital divide is still literally, uh, you, know, uh, you know, divided in some cases. People just don't have access to these, uh, these basic things, which again goes to the point of like, how can we not innovate our way out of these problems? These seem like if any country could solve it, it should be us. Yeah, I think we can innovate our way out, out of these. And, you know, I think, I think the government can play a role in catalyzing, you know, uh, uh, you know some of that. Yeah, I think about that. Uh, have you read the Robert Caro series on Lyndon Johnson? No. Oh, it's it's epic. It's obviously, I think, some of the best books ever written about Texas. But this is where Johnson makes his name as a politician is that like 
the Texas Hill Country just didn't have electricity until like the 40s. <laughs> and because they basically uh, both government and business was sort of like, we don't care about these people, right? Like they, they don't vote, they don't have any money. Um, what do they matter? And, and, and Johnson uses his bureaucratic competence to wield the levers of power to solve an intractable problem. And so, you know, he becomes this sort of political hero in Texas because he brought lights to and, and electric power to people, you know, well after everyone thought this was solved, but of course it, it wasn't solved. And, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, we, we were just driving across the country and we visited that we, we drove over the Hoover Dam and you're just like, man, we used to do some crazy things as a country. We don't do that much of that anymore. And we did them a lot faster too yes. than, than, than we do them now. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there, there, there are a lot of protections uh, in place. There's a lot of friction and uh, not all of it is helping us, you know, build the future that, that, that we need. But do you think part of it is also that it's just so much easier to build an app or a website and uh, in, in many cases, so lucrative that some of the best talent of a generation has been misallocated towards maybe superficial problems. Like, like instead of having engineers who are designing the next Hoover Dam, they're designing algorithms that make you uh, more angry at your neighbor at <laughs> Facebook, you know, on Facebook. <laughs> Yeah, the confirmation bias reinforcement algorithms. Yes. I mean, I think the, 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 that's been very lucrative and certainly whatever is lucrative often attracts, you know, uh, you know a, a number of the top talent and top graduates. But, I, you know, I think there's also another thing going on, which is more and more people are looking for more meaning in their life and more purpose. And, you know, they are attracted to these more noble uh, and, and meaningful, uh, you know, endeavors. And so, yeah, I, I guess I, I remain optimistic that, that we, 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 we won't have a problem attracting the best and brightest uh, if the necessary conditions are there to uh, allow them to succeed. And again, I go back to there is an enormous amount, never, you know, uh, there's never been as much funding as there is now for huge, complicated problems to be solved, even with all the, you know, challenges and obstacles that are out there. So how do you think about that philanthropically as you uh, decide where you're going to direct time or resources? Uh, what, what problems excite you as being problems, one, that you think can be solved, and two, you think you can contribute or your foundations can contribute to solve it? Yeah, we, we focus a lot on children in urban poverty, which takes us to education and improving the education system, you know, uh, bit by bit, you know, and, and piece by piece, uh, and also in uh, healthcare and, you know, healthcare outcomes, uh, family economic stability, um, and you know how do you how do you change the tr life trajectory that somebody's on and help them get on a on a completely new path? And um, you know, I think I think uh, I think philanthropy can play a big role there, and we're 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 doing a lot there. I also think what's interesting is you're seeing a lot more for profit businesses. That have a social, uh, you know, purpose as their as their underlying, uh, 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 you know, objective, and in many cases, those for profit organizations are moving the needle even more than the philanthropic ones, uh, and so it's a combination of of, uh, of of factors that that you know I think will will you know will ultimately drive drive progress. Yeah, so something like the Dell Children's Hospital. What do you think about when you decide to endow something like that? What what is when when you let's say flash forward twenty years and it's a success? What does that success look like to you? Well, in that case, it was it was pretty straightforward, right? Um, 
you know, the, the city has been doubling in size every decade for four decades, <laughs> Yeah, which, which is kind of amazing, you know. It doesn't seem like it's slowing down. Yeah, 250,000, 500, a million, 2 million, 4 million, just kind of keeps going. And so the, the capacity for the healthcare system, you know, wasn't keeping up. And certainly if a child or an adult had any serious medical condition, they're going to Houston or Dallas. That's just the way it was. Sure. And um, that wasn't great. And, you know, uh, so it, it was kind of an obvious place where there was a, a need. And we also felt that, you know, I mean, Austin was kind of the biggest city in the country that didn't have a medical school also. Really? Okay. <laughs> and and it also had this great university, University of Texas at Austin, uh, and and so, you know, the the children's hospital and the pediatric research institute that that we helped create, in some ways, were precursors to ultimately creating a residency program and then ultimately a, a medical school. So this has been kind of like a like a twenty year plus plan to improve the the healthcare infrastructure and attract, you know, world class academics and and you know care providers uh and and also create this ecosystem of biotech companies that's starting to spring up so um yeah it's been it's been fun and and it it's you know so, certainly something that you know the the, the community has needed uh, and and i'll tell you um uh every every so often you know susan and i'll get a letter from a parent and these are like the most meaningful letters you ever get, <laughs> you know, when, 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 when you understand, you know, how a place like a children's hospital affects, you know, a, a, you know, a single child's life. Uh, you know, it's, it's just, it's just super touching. I do think that's one hopefully good outcome that comes out of the pandemic. I was reading a, an article that was basically saying that sort of post the second world war, America especially took a very, individualistic approach to healthcare. You have your doctor, you take care of yourself, you do what you want to do. Um, because we'd solved a, a lot of the big sort of public health issues. And the pandemic is sort of serving as a reminder that that health is also public health and vice versa, right? And that the way that we are tied up together even though we maybe live very different lives or in very different socioeconomic uh, brackets, that you know the position of the most vulnerable or the the, the least uh, affluent parts of society uh, expose everyone else to risk. That that our that our fates are all tied up with each other. And I do hope we take from this, we carry that energy forward. Um, because when everyone's in their silo, it might seem like you're taking care of yourself, but you're you're also putting yourself at risk as a result. Yeah, I think I think one thing we can we can hope for is that you know uh, there's been a you know an outbreak of of empathy you know yes. <laughs> among, among among humans as we've right. kind of seen seen uh, the the challenges that everyone has faced and. How can we? How can we? You know, uh, help help each other and and you know create create a you know create a better world. Well, just how uh, interdependent we all are with each other. When suddenly um, people, you are reliant on people to do things, uh, either because you can't do them yourself or you don't want to do them yourself, and you go, oh yeah, somebody has to do this, and it's probably not fun <laughs> to be them. And it's probably hard, you know, not to have these things that I take for granted, whether that's health care or, you know, child care or any of these things that we just assume uh, everyone has. You know, they they don't. And uh, it makes their life very hard. And as a result, you know, puts a, a potentially everyone at, at some kind of a risk. Yep. Agreed. Well, this was so awesome. I was really glad to talk. I. Uh, Loved the book. I particularly love, maybe that's the last thing. I love the appendix, the things I, I believe. What made you decide to to put the this, what is it, uh, 21 commandments at the end? Do you, did you have to think of these for the book or is this something that you have 
organizationally or in your office? Like, uh, how do you think about that? You know, as, as I was working on the book, um, you know, it, it, occurred, it occurred to me that it'd be a good idea to, to have something like this, you know, toward, toward, toward the end of the book. Um, and so I just kind of refined it and honed it. I mean, anybody who's worked at our company could probably recite all of these in one form or another. Um, and, you know, uh, but they, they're, they're, they're definitely, you know, as I said, I think the kind of principles, things I believe, ideals, and uh, yeah, they've worked well for me. Your mileage may vary, but, <laughs> but uh, um, you know, uh, those are those are the things that that you know that 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 that, that you know I believe are are super important. Yeah, my favorite was thirteen: confidence, not arrogance; humility, not ego. Which sort of goes to the the betting on yourself thing that we were talking about. If you're betting on yourself out of ego, it's probably not going to go well. But if you're betting on yourself because you have a strong sense of both the strengths and weaknesses of your position, that's maybe a good place to be. Yep. Agreed. Love it. Well, I hope to see you soon. Absolutely, Ryan. Hey, great to be with you. Stay well. It was awesome. All right, I'll let you go. Okay, thanks. Take care.